the other. Uh, Jane, you recently wrote an op-ed for the, for the Washington Post, and you said in it, I'm scared. Now, Jane, I normally think of you as fearless. So I want to know more about what's scaring you. <laughs> <laughs> What's not to be scared, right? Right. It, like a whole lot of people, and probably a lot of people in this room, it never occurred to me that Trump could get elected. Right. And when it happened, um, I felt a real need to understand how this could happen. And I did a lot of reading. Um, I did a lot of talking to my friend since the 70s, she said to Karen. And, you know, I came to realize that it happened because people like us had left a vacuum <clears throat> in the middle of this country. A vacuum where a lot of men and women who used to have good union jobs, who could support a family, who could own a home, who could send their kids to college, in this post-industrial era of globalization, were suddenly part of the gig economy and they were scared, and they hurt, and they were angry, and they were totally justified in all of those things. And who stepped into the vacuum? And, you know, it, uh, yeah, he spoke to them using dog whistle politics, making people think that the problems that they were facing were because of people of color and, and immigrants. And so I said to myself, well, the, the way to solve this is to get to those people who used to be the bedrock of the labor movement, who were the bedrock of the Democratic Party. We have to peel them away, at least those who voted for Obama and then Trump. You know, now a lot of people said, well, why bother? Yeah, they're all racist anyway. Forget it. Go for the low-hanging fruit. Women, people of color, millennials. I don't think strategically that we can do that, but we morally can't do that. Just ignore all these people who were dying with opioid overdoses because of grief and desperation. We must reach them with a narrative that will make them understand that the dog whistling is distracting them. Blame it on the people of color while the real enemy is taking their, picking their pockets. They have to understand who the real enemy is. So I thought, well, my old friend Karen, after uh, 9 to 5, she founded this organization, Working America. Maybe I'd better start getting involved with them. <coughs> is that more? Is that answer? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jane, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the movement side. You've been an activist for five decades. Um, and you said also in this op-ed article that one thing that you've learned is people can change. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that and, and uh, your experience in Scranton or meeting some of our staff and, you know, how it comes together for you in Working America. You know, I'm old and I've been doing this for a long time and people, young ones especially, they say to me, well, how do you keep up your energy? How do you stay hopeful? And I'll tell you why because I've seen so many people really transform, really transform. I did. I mean, I, I, you know, up until a certain age, oh, I don't even remember, but it was you know, <laughs> not so young. You know, I lived a pretty uninvolved, hedonistic life. And, and then it was American soldiers that caused me to, to <clears throat> yeah. And so I've experienced it, and I have seen people change. And I have been to enough doors in Modesto, California, in San Diego, in Michigan, and most recently in Scranton, Pennsylvania, to have, really to have seen miracles. It's you know in Scranton, um, I was with a black woman, and I was sure this was a basically white working class community that nobody would open the door. I was, you know, what you said was so true. You can never assume anything. I couldn't believe that people were, they would talk because we asked questions and we really listened and they would talk for a half hour and then they would say, I never talk to people, why am I, why am I talking to you? Um, and they didn't, it's not, they didn't know who I was, you know, if somebody shows up in a totally unexpected place and with a baseball hat on and everything, they didn't know. They were mostly talking to this black woman. And 
nobody's talking about. Mm -hmm. Nobody shows up for these people. Not Hillary's campaign, mm -hmm. the Democratic Party in general, they go for the TV ads, but research has shown that it's talking to people, not just after Labor Day, right close to the election, but year-round. Mm -hmm. That's what I love so much. Working America is there year-round, and they become the trusted messenger. It's, I don't remember what town in, 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 in Ohio, there was a sign on a lawn that said, no solicitors wanted, Working America welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and we never criticize Trump, we never criticize Fox News. We listen and then we try to say something they don't know about what it means if Trump gets reelected or gets elected in terms of the things that they're, that they're interested in. And um, you, you don't spend a lot of time, but it's incredible how much you learn. Yeah. I learned yeah. so much getting out of my liberal West Coast bubble and having the privilege to go with an organization that's as solid as Working America into these into these communities, and it changes people that we talk to, and it changes us as well. And you know, I've I went to a, an annual conference of of the um, Working America canvassers in Chicago, and I, I had the pleasure of spending quite a bit of time with them. And I I just I can't tell you what these they're young. They answered ads on Craigslist, and then they fell in love. Because, you know, the, to be working at something where you know that you are changing lives and changing the future has clearly infused them with hope and strength. And they're just, they're amazing. And if you, if you saw them, you'd think, well, that, you know why that person is going to get anybody going. <laughs> There's one guy, the, the Muslim, what's his name? Jihad. <laughs> one of their best canvassers in Pennsylvania, Jihad. <laughs> you just never know. What Matt said was so true. You can't write anybody off. Well, I mean, sometimes you can. And you know right away. You open the door and it's, mm, forget it. Okay, fine. But, the mo what is it, two out of three people sign up, join. And our motto is strength in numbers. Yeah. You know, if we all get together, we will be able to, to win this. But that, the, the point is, talk to your friends. Talk to people you know. And we hate to say it, but we haven't overthrown capitalism yet. Money really matters. And you guys have the ability to try to raise money. But while you're talking to your friends, we need money. <laughs> <laughs> It just kills me knowing how effective Working America is in the communities that they can afford to go in. You know, my opinion is that the Democratic Party should turn over all the money that they spend on TV ads to Working America. It's what the party should be doing. So since they won't do that, at least not yet, we need to try to make up for their lack of understanding and their lack of vision and make it possible for Working America to, to go into all these districts and precincts where they can really flip votes. Uh -huh. I want to thank you, Craig. I can't thank say you, anything Anne. after that. Wait, wait, wait. There's a... So there are two people, staff people in the back. Tony and Katie. You can talk to them about how to make a contribution tonight or later. And we're going to hang out for a while. Yeah.